Very, very wealthy Middle East sovereign fund, and you're managing, I don't know, $500 billion. And you don't need any more oil as an investment because you've already got that in the ground. So you go to an indexer like me and say, look, give me the S&P, less energy, less airlines. And that's what indexers do. So we as an industry get to see fund flows 24-7 every day. And there are billions of dollars out there waiting for policy because for all the excitement about Bitcoin, for all the excitement about crypto, for all of the wonderful productivity, these products and blockchain and everything that's promised that you're going to be hearing about the next three days, these massive pools of capital, these trillion dollar pools own this much crypto, this much, practically nothing. It's the purvey of high net worth individuals, hedge funds and retail investors. And that's okay. But what we're missing is policy. When we get policy and the regulator regulates, that's not a negative thing. The spigots of capital are going to flood into this sector like you've never seen. And so for those of us that can invest in it now, you're getting ahead of what's going to be a huge wave of interest when policy occurs. I predict in the next 10 years that crypto, blockchain, Bitcoin, all of this innovation will be the 12th sector of the S&P. Now, why do I say that? Because Bitcoin is not a coin, it's software. Ethereum is software. Avalanche is software. Helium is software. Solana is software. It's all software. And the smartest hands over keyboards today in the world are developing on the chain and bringing innovation to financial services, which in the end is the largest sector on earth. Now, what we need is policy. We need government to catch up with us so that we don't lose leadership in America to this very important 12th sector of the economy. There's no question. So let me give you a quick update, because I've been spending a lot of time in Washington in the last three months, a lot of time. And the good news is, on a bipartisan basis, there are many senators and reps that are thinking about this in a proactive way. So I'm going to give you what I'm calling the five vectors of policy and give you an update of where we're at on this stuff. Because I've actually read these bills. They're big. A lot of reading. A lot of bedtime reading here. But there's a lot of good innovation occurring. Let's start with the big daddy bill that's coming out of Cynthia Lummis. She is coming here on Friday to give a keynote. This is a very important milestone to have a senator come here and address this important sector with a bipartisan mandate. That signals that regulation is coming and that is a good thing. That's vector number one. Vector number two, the president himself in his direct order, his executive order, talked about crypto as something that he wouldn't make illegal. That was the most important message in there. But there was also a concern about climate change, which I'll get to in a minute. Then there's BlackRock, the Larry Fink mandate that has discussed this sector as well, also a concern about ESG and climate change. Bill Haggerty dropped a bill. Two pages. I spoke to the senator last night. A two-page bill that would make stable coins legal. This is a genius piece of legislature. If it's two pages, every senator can read it. And it's very simple. <laughs> what this says is this. Why is this any different than a money market fund? Why can't we have a simple audit every 30 days with the underlying security and side of it, whether it be USDC or any other stable coin? And why can't we limit the duration of the asset to 12 months or less? And then why don't we let the market compete to provide stable coins, which are now way past $100 billion, and allow institutions to put this on their balance sheets? two-page bill. There's a senator that wants to do business. I, of course, applaud this mandate because my own auditor won't let me and my operating company do anything with stablecoin because there's no regulation on it. So maybe the best way to approach this for all of us that are interested in crypto is to pick one pillar of value. And right now, I would argue that stablecoins are one of the fastest growing asset classes outside of Bitcoin and help this become policy and law 
and watch what happens. And the reason you should care is, if it's backed by the U.S. dollar, it will become the reserve currency of the earth. That's what will happen. And why would we want to give that up to any other country? Why would we ever give that innovation up? So let's regulate this. Let's get behind this bill and make it happen. And I'm not asking the federal government to write one line of code. That's not their job. Let the free market, let the private sector develop these stablecoin products and let them compete, just like Fidelity competes with their money market fund, like Schwab competes. They're regulated and everybody uses them when they have a cash balance on their account. Let's do the same thing here. That way, we have the innovators coding and we have the government regulating. That's a great outcome. It's coming soon. Now, let's talk about the minefields in the five vectors of policy. We'll start with the SEC. Now, I don't know if you read these memorandums, but a few weeks ago, they started proposing that in addition to financial audits in all companies that are public, in all 11 sectors of the economy, that they have a carbon audit, that they get somebody, if you claim that you're carbon neutral, you're going to get audited every quarter. Now, in the Bitcoin mining industry, where I'm a participant, the way we get carbon neutral is we buy carbon offsets. The problem with a carbon offset is the tracking error is so huge that no public auditor will sign off on those statements. You can say you're carbon neutral, but there's nobody going to sign it at the risk of being offside with the SEC. So if the SEC adopts that policy, that's bad for proof of work, and it's bad for Bitcoin mining, because the first pioneers of this in the US were very concerned about being ESG compliant, and they went to that market. They went to the offset market. Two weeks ago in the EU, they tried to ban proof of work, because they were so concerned about how much carbon it was doing. Now, here's why Bitcoin mining is going to save the world. If this policy gets implemented, because it's also in the ESG mandate that Larry Fink at BlackRock put in place, and it's also mentioned directly deep in the executive order of the president himself, it's a direct swipe at Bitcoin mining. But why is Bitcoin mining good for the earth? Because the next generation of Bitcoin miners, and some of them are represented right here, are starting to work with energy that does not require carbon, hydroelectricity and nuclear power, wind and solar. The drive to produce Bitcoin is so economic in value that they will go ahead and fund the next generation of machines and turbines. 90% of dams built in America in the last 100 years contemplated hydroelectricity but never installed the turbines. I'll install the turbines. Why? Because it's great economics if I can use that and not be hassled by a carbon audit. This is the future of Bitcoin mining. We will be developing power for all communities while we mine coin in an ethical and 100% green mandate that we can do with hydroelectricity. This speaks to Montana. It speaks to the Tennessee Valley, upstate New York, Quebec, Canada, northern Norway. All of these places, Georgia, have an abundance of unused hydro, and that is the future of Bitcoin mining. And it's a good thing. It provides for communities. It provides extra power.